My parents uh, really worked harder than anybody to uh, try to figure out um, how to handle and, and, and support uh, somebody who was going through uh, an increasingly uh, strong addiction to opioids um, as she transitioned from painkillers to heroin um, and it, it slowly crept into her life and, and took over more and more of her life. And she cycled through different rehabs, but we continually were struggling to find places for her to stay. Uh, we were trying to find places for her to be able to get into, beds that were open. Um, and we also just didn't know um, what what we were missing, what we were, if we, what we were doing was the right thing. And so we tried a lot of different things, but there wasn't a ton of support and there were so many gaps in the system that it was a struggle for us. Jenna, towards the end, was doing better. Um, she was almost 60 days um, in recovery uh, when she relapsed again. Um, before that relapse, she began to reforge connections with family and friends. Um, and her goal, her hope was, was to help people. She had one of the last conversations she had with my mother was, you know, mom, when I get out of this rehab, basically, um, we're gonna help people. And so when she passed of an overdose sometime later, um, we wanted to kind of carry on that legacy of helping people um, like she would have wanted. That was her last promise, and so our organization is Jenna's promise because of that. So I am a nurse practitioner. Um, I opened up the Johnson Health Center, which is um, very low barrier, uh, easy access to medical care, addiction medicine, and mental health services. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I am the coordinator for the Parents in Recovery Support Program through the North Central Vermont Recovery Center. Um, and we're located downstairs here at Jenna's house. Um, and we offer a lot of supports um, to folks in all stages of recovery and helping them kind of navigate those early days, mm -hmm. um, which then um, puts us in this lovely position of having Carolyn and Jenna's promise for access. Doing drugs, that's just sort of, the, that's that's the first step, right? That's the yeah. easiest part. That, <laughs> right? that is that's like, what I always tell yeah. everyone, like getting the drugs gone, that part's mm -hmm. easy. We got that. That's no problem. But learning how to be an adult, learning how to be a member of society, learning how to be in this community again, mm -hmm. that's where our that's, work comes in. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and sort of the first thing that I do when people come in is really try to establish that this is a really safe place, that you can be human, you can be messy, you can be wherever you're at. And um, I also encourage people, if you catch yourself in a lie, tell me, we'll, f you know, we'll, we'll just move forward. Yeah. And, and sort of that's the whole philosophy of, is just meeting people where they're at, picking a problem to start working on, whether that's the addiction piece or the mental health piece or, or maybe a physical ailment. And then we just move from there, you know, and, and it helps people to be able to have a, a gentle medical setting, mm -hmm. you know, where they can come in and it's, it's a little um, less intimidating than walking into, um, you know, a, a sterile. A yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we just, we really work hard on trying to make it uh, easy, low barrier, easy access. I, you know, I think a big piece of it is that um, there is a lot of stigma around substance use disorders, opiate use disorders, and a lot of, of shame around it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, people have had experiences um, in other medical settings um, or the hospital or wherever they've been that have left them feeling like, you know, um, like they're not good enough for care. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And so um, that's, that's again, that philosophy of just having people come where they're at. It's not like most people don't know that they're mm -hmm. doing something wrong, that, mm -hmm. they're, that they're hurting themselves, mm -hmm. that they're hurting their family, mm -hmm. especially if they've, um, you know, resorted to crime in mm -hmm. some way to mm -hmm. feed their habit. So there's already a sense of, of not good enough. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you go to get help and they, and they 
thinking mm-hmm. that it'll somehow shake you out of it. They guilt yeah. you and shame right. you some more. Right. Um, you know, mm-hmm. there's just this enormous stress on parents in society in general. And then mm-hmm. you add the layer of substance use disorder mm-hmm. and probably mental health yeah. and probably poverty. So now you've got all of these pieces that are stacked against you and you feel an incredible amount of just responsibility. Like, what have I done? I have failed somehow. Mm-hmm. When in fact, the systems are set up for people to fail. Yeah. <laughs> we are not helping people be successful successful in the traditional ways. You know, I think, I really think that the the biggest message that needs to get out there is that recovery is possible. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we've got a lot, I'd say the majority of us are in recovery Mm -hmm. and we've got, we've, we've got solid examples of what recovery can look like. We do, we partner with WIC, we also partner with UVM Extension, Katie Black, nutritionist, comes out. We do, we just wrapped up a six week meal prep program. Um, We're also, we got a grant for gardening, so we have some gardens out front. We're doing herb gardens and then in the fall we'll be doing, using our produce to make um, salsa and spaghetti sauce and she's going to teach us how to can. Um, So it's great. Um, Mondays and Fridays we usually have something cooking. People come in, drop in before the meeting, have a meal with kiddos. I offer childcare for a couple of meetings, so then I grab the kids, we go play, and mom and dad can go to a meeting. Um, We like to keep some donations, food donations on hand. Um, Can the community donate stuff like that? Yep, absolutely. The community can also come in and take stuff if they need it, because we are a high poverty area, so it's open to everybody and anybody. And Mm -hmm. we work with local uh, caterers as well, so when they have leftover food, they tend to come and drop it off as well. That is so cool. Yeah. Okay. It's really great, and that's one thing that has caught on in the community. Um, A lot of our elderly folks show up looking for food. So, which is amazing. Like, I'm happy we're here to help them. We did um, Thanksgiving meals, and I think we served out 150 meals. Um, It was COVID, so we just did individual meals and left them on the porch in a refrigerator. But we served 150 folks that day. So, um, you know, we depend a lot on donations. Uh, Different providers donate stuff. We have... um, uh, like the frozen community meals from um, the schools, they I just went and picked up a bunch of leftovers, so we have a lot of that stuff in the fridges at all times for people to take. I do supervised visits for DCF here as well, okay. so moms and dads can come in and make a meal in the kitchen and hang out and have dinner instead of being in the DCF office, you know? So oh, we yeah. like to have food on hand here for them to do that this too. Is giving- I think we're down to two, but we had three um, older gentlemen that have had knee replacements, um, but they're in our sober community and they come and work out and in our gym and do all their um, their occupational therapy and physical therapy right here. Yeah. And it's just, it's easier for them to access. It's easier, you know, it's more comfortable for them. Yeah. And um, so that's been an, another piece yeah. of, of having that and accessible. Even just as small as just having the bathrooms be fully ADA. So even if they don't need the lift and they go down the stairs, knowing that they have a bar to pull themselves up and they have plenty of space and it just gives them that one more sense of comfort. I mean, you've got a volunteer for the campaign who's blind and we're going, okay, so wait, okay, so he can't do this the normal way that everybody else is doing. How do we accommodate it? Oh, okay, we can just do it like this. But it's, you just, you really don't yeah. realize unless you're in it, unless you're serving Faced people, with it. Yeah. And serving the community. And I think it's really easy to take for granted. Absolutely. And so that's cool that you guys yeah. are really thinking about that. Oh, you're <laughs> Gracie. This is Gracie. Hi, Gracie. <laughs> Hi! Look at those cheeks! <laughs> cheeks and thighs! So Can I pinch your cheeks? It's a go for your it! Oh my god, look at those little okay, guys! <laughs> I love little fat baby cheeks! I know, she's so cute! Hi! Hi. Hi. So this is my room! Yes! Um, I have the best office in the world! Yes, you do! Um, yeah, we've been here a year in August, and it's just been amazing! 
the, I moved from Morseville when I was first building the program, um, and I had like a little closet office. Um, so this was incredible to move in and be able to shop and buy all this stuff. And we try to have, you know, we just really want the, the families to feel like this is a safe, special spot for them. Um, you know, any toy you can imagine, we probably have it here. We've seen a lot of um, teenagers that just need that support as well, you know, that their, their parents maybe have active use or they've grown up with it or, you know, and it's, it's hard to find that support because um, they're carrying a lot of that shame stigma as well. I have 17, coming up on 17 years in recovery myself. Um, I have worked in human services my whole adult life. Um, I've worked with DCF and for DCF. Um, I do have an associate's degree, but I feel like that's so far from the work that I do that it's not even relevant at this point. Um, but I've been doing this work for two years and really just based it on what barriers did I have in my early recovery and how can I remove them and, and what programs would have been beneficial for me to find success much easier, you know, than I did. Because, you know, 17 years ago, things were a lot different. Yes. Um, there was, uh, you went to AA or NA and you got on methadone. Like, that was it. That's what you did. And good luck to you. <laughs> yep, that sounds about right, actually. Um, and so that's what I did. And I figured it out. I found my footing. But um, very early in my recovery, about 30 days in, I lost my children's father to an overdose. So I then had to figure it out alone. And that's where it really, it almost took me back out. Yeah. And I was like this, you know, we have to, we have to support people better than that. Yeah. Um, we're, we're affecting generations. If we, if we don't help the parents, then we're just lining these kids up for the same exact. Exactly. I feel super fortunate that I had that opportunity to work with DCF. Um, I worked as a case aide, which meant that I basically supervised visits and had those face-to-face -face relationships with the families. Um, and that's where I kind of found my passion in this. I kept coming back around to these families that were lacking the supports and lacking the resources. Um, and typically, they had substance use within within the problem. And so, I'd love to hear that you're that you're able to do that and use that experience to speak to how you work with people here. The cafe, the roaster, and promising goods to show you. Oh, oh awesome! All right, you guys are just barely in, then, huh? Right. Well, yeah, thank you, Chris, right. So I appreciate <laughs> Absolutely. It. Right. Can I hug you? Uh, sure. Thank you. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. All right. Bye, little cheeks. Bye, cheeks. <laughs> My name is Jenny Brown, and I am in charge of the health and wellness program here. I've been here about a month, and so I'm in the middle of still developing the program. Right now, I am offering bike rides every Friday, um, which is for the entire community. It's open to the entire community. Cool. Um, and actually, some of the girls from the Ray Hope House have um, joined in on that, which is great because cool. they don't always it's not always easy to get them to do activities. Okay, and what is so. this? The, that's one of our housing locations. Ah, got yes. it, okay. Cool. Yeah, so that's on Fridays, and then um, I, re I just added today weightlifting Wednesdays. Cool. And that will basically look like, <laughs> we have any, we have many choices for the weights. Um, we have free weights, we, we have kettlebells. We have, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> She's great. Get it, girl. I used to be a bodybuilder. Really? Yes. Oh my god. That's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, we have kettlebell. We have medicine balls. We have um um oh my gosh, it's, I'm blanking my arm. We have basically everything. Everything. What drove me and kind of catapulted me into sobriety was um, a, a criminal mishap run-in type thing. And, <laughs> I know something um, about that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and it really got the ball rolling. And then slowly, piece by piece, I just, um, I just started kind of putting my life together. And yeah. here I am, ready to offer my wisdom and love and services awesome. to the community. I think that there is definitely research that has been done that proves that replacing those things with a physical activity especially 
um, it is um, you're more apt to be successful. Um, and definitely, personally, I can speak from that. Yeah. That um, that that's true. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really like a huge percentage of it. I dare even say 90 yeah, percent of the recovery. This beautiful donation from the Divided Sky Foundation through Trey Anastasio from Fish. It started off with this little sample roaster here. This was purchased and then left in Greg's shop for a year or so. And so I started on that and just developed some profiles and whatnot. And then the grant money came in for this. We set it up and uh, yeah, we're, we're rolling. Very cool. I mean, it's like the way I see it is it's a lot better than getting a business card. You, you know, you're supporting an organization that's really great, getting a product, enjoying it, and it's all going back into the uh, foundation, which is so did awesome. You, did you used to roast coffee or was it literally just, oh, I'm just going to start messing around and figure it out? It was, yeah, um, pretty much just messing around, figuring it out, read a lot of books, a lot of videos. Um, so you sell to some local places? Yeah, local places and then some local co-ops, some grocery stores, um, working on getting into a... Um, couple cafes we've got like the two sons coffee guys we've teamed up with them to some extent and they've been uh using our coffee solely which is great cool and so of course it'll be in the cafe when we'll it be opens. in the cafe that's going to be a huge a huge uh account for us awesome. uh, so which of uh, which blend is your favorite so i really like single origin coffee so i probably my favorite right now i have this um well, I have a natural process Ethiopian from Gera, which is a region there. It's delicious, super fruity, delicious. There's also another Ethiopian that I really like that's from Yerga Chef, and it's a washed process, so it's a little kind of cleaner and more floral rather than the fruity side. All right. um, and then I also have that Papua New Guinea that I like a lot, which is um, just single origin, grown by the Sakaka people of Papua New Guinea because their whole land got taken over by, you know, the imperialists, whatever, oh, no. came in, started growing coffee there, because they were like, oh, you have a good region for this. And so now they've kind of taken that back and they're growing it uh, for themselves. And it's wow. killer coffee. Yeah, it's, it's very good. Yeah? It's very good. Is, is it a, okay, but here's the thing, is it a dark roast? No. See, I'm a dark roast person. So we've got like the number two, which is actually, has a name now, it's gonna be called the Huxley, named Huxley. after Jenna's cat, Huxley, Aww. which is a beautiful, majestic cat. Cool. Um, long, long black hair. I hear the single origin thing all of the time. Mm -hmm. Explain to me, I mean, obviously I can understand the words, right? It's from one place, mm -hmm. but why is that so important? What makes it better? It's just kind of like, if you think of wine, you think of like the terroir, like where, like the place of where it comes from. So you can kind of taste place through a product. Oh, so it's like with chocolate and oysters and wine and coffee is one of those things. So just depending on what kind of soil they have, what kind of sunshine they're getting, what elevation, you can, you can kind of then decide what you like and maybe find blends with those additions. Cool. So in the future you can know what you like. Like I know like I love Ethiopian coffees. I really like coffees from Burundi. And so I kind of channeled that away. And then in the future, when I want to do a blend, I'll be like, well, might be a little strong of a flavor for somebody, but I know that I can work this in and get something really nice out of it. Very cool. We just started. We haven't even been going a year, so. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, really, we've been legal for about six months, seven yeah. months. And you've already got this great of a distribution chain going? We're working on it. Really, it's, amazing. it's just Greg and I right now yeah. for the most part. And um, I just had some great help with one from one of the women in the program today, helping bag these up, bagging up some a little frack packs for the, uh, the local electric co-op. Cool. Right. So. And then he's got this idea. Andrews. And I always pick on Andrew a little bit, and that's what it is, too, because I really appreciate Ooh, sure it. Is. But he is pretty green yeah and I'm an old construction guy so we meet somewhere in the, in middle. the middle but this is made out of corn so you can it's biodegradable and it doesn't melt with the hot water no no what? so 30 30 million of these go in a dump every day 
And these, you can recycle, and people are recycling them. Yeah, you can compost them. Yeah, compost what? them. Yeah. That's amazing. And like Andrew says, if a turtle eats this, it's going to be okay, right? Yeah. Maybe. It's a fade straws. No. They're, uh, they're marine biodegradable as well as home compostable. Take it out, chew on it. It's plastic, but it's... Um, it's their own it's their own biopolymers that they've developed. They make a couple other products too, but they're really cool straws cuz you don't notice anything. It's not like pasta or cardboard where it degrades as you're drinking. That's like a plastic straw. They're marine biodegradable though, so that you can put that into a into like any sort of marine environment or I don't know about fresh water, but I know it's in a saltwater environment they'll break down in like 60 days or something or 90 days. So Andrew puts a whole new vibe on these kind of things, you know, which is pretty, it's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, he's teaching me a lot of stuff and I like it. Excellent. I'm kind of open-minded, but you know, I'm in construction, right? So we, our job is we dig holes and put in it. Yeah. Might be a building, it might be a pipe, it might be <laughs> who knows what it is, right? Yeah. So that's have my background. He's teaching me Hey, you can actually do this a little nicer. Yeah. <laughs> what we find here is that we can only really make a difference in, you know, a 20, 30 mile radius. Local. For me, all the stuff going on in Washington, there's nothing I'm going to do about that. Yeah. You know, so why put my effort there? Yeah, you I'm know? grateful to I live mean, in we Vermont. Have... I'm grateful to be able to make change yeah. in the community. We can here. Where you can see the difference. You can. You can see the difference yeah. that your work makes. Yeah, the old way of doing things, you know, bullying and pushing through and it's my way or the highway. Mm -hmm. Those days are done. Yeah. They're done. Because you'll never build anything like that anymore because people want to have a say. Andrew wants to feel like what he's doing here, he owns it mm -hmm. and he's proud of it. Yep. And if I'm in here saying, no, you got to do this, 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 and this, he, he's going to get sick of that pretty quick. Yeah. You know, so we let him run. And he does a great job. We're very proud Excellent. of him.